With the fighting hopelessly bogged down in France, London is determined to open a new front in the Middle East. Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, proposes a combined land and sea attack against the Dardanelles Straits and the Gallipoli Peninsula. Once in control of the Straits, the Royal Navy can steam into the Bosporus, a narrow strip of ocean separating Europe from Asia, and bring Istanbul under its powerful guns. At that point, Churchill speculates that the Ottoman government will sue for peace. Lord Horatio Kitchener, Secretary of War for Great Britain, has strong reservations about any plan that will take guns and men away from the Western Front in Europe. One of England's great military heroes, he believes the Middle East is not important and is reluctant to approve the plan. Then Churchill sells Kitchener and First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher on the idea of a strictly naval attack. Admiral Sackville Carden takes command of the invasion fleet, and it leaves for the Dardanelles in March 1915. Lord Fisher still has his doubts when a German wireless message is intercepted by British intelligence. It reveals that the Turkish forts guarding either side of the Dardanelles are running low on shells for their massive guns. Suddenly, Fisher becomes very enthusiastic about the operation and its chances for success. By March 15th, the Anglo-French fleet is crossing the Mediterranean, and its admiral is suffering a nervous breakdown, brought on by the strain of commanding a fleet of 16 old warships that London expects to run a very dangerous gantlet. Admiral Carden is in no shape to lead his fleet into battle. He turns his command over to Vice Admiral John de Robeck the day before the attack. On March 18th, at about 10.30 in the morning, British and French battleships trade salvos with the Turkish fortresses while a line of minesweepers moves into the straits. De Robeck is well aware that explosive mines have been laid across the passage. They must be removed before the warships can proceed. As the fleet turns starboard to let the minesweepers pass, it runs smack into a string of undetected mines. The French battleship Bouvet is hit and sinks within two minutes. As it rolls over into the sea, the captain locks himself inside the conning tower. Nearly the entire crew is lost. Two British battleships, the Ocean and Irresistible, also go down. Three other battleships, the British Inflexible and the French Galois and Souffren, also fall victim to the mines and suffer severe damage. In a matter of minutes, six Allied warships are the victims of Turkish mines. Suddenly, the scarcity of Turkish artillery shells doesn't really matter anymore. At this point, Admiral de Robeck must make a critical decision that will determine the future of the entire war. He can press forward toward Istanbul and risk losing even more of his fleet or he can withdraw from the straits and come back to fight another day. Little does he realize that the Turks are so short of mines that they've used the ones captured from the Russians in the Black Sea. Reflecting on the scene before him, with hundreds of dead and warships burning in the water, he is reported to say, I suppose I am done for. The Admiral confers with the landing force commander, General Ian Hamilton, they decide that the Navy should wait until British troops can land and secure at least one side of the Straits. They transmit their opinion to London, and the Admiralty agrees. Churchill is appalled by the decision to withdraw. Winston Churchill, with his, his gift as a warrior, understood that it, you, you've got to take losses, if, if, and, and you've got to be ready to take losses. Uh, to win great rewards. Uh, but uh, despite Churchill's passionate desire to keep on going, the uh, admiral in charge decided to turn around. It was heartbreaking for Churchill. The Turks had just run out of ammunition. The leaders of the Ottoman Empire were packing their things to flee. Everyone was ready to surrender. And the British admiral turned around. 
He argues violently against the retreat, with Istanbul only one hour away. He rallies Kitchener and Prime Minister Herbert Asquith to his cause, then shoots off a strong cable to Admiral Jarobek, ordering him to renew the attack immediately. But the telegram goes nowhere. First Sea Lord Jackie Fisher refuses to send it. Churchill storms away, anguished in his belief that the war in the Middle East could have been won on that day.